Anyway, that's just a curiosity. Let's get back to the mirror because that's what matters for propagating the light. Now we have a mirror just by having some material, water or plastic or glass. And that's actually used whenever you make a phone call to guide the light from wherever you are to wherever your phone call goes. If you take a slab of plastic or glass and you put light in and you put it in in such a way that there's total internal reflection, then this light ray can't escape. It bounces without any loss from here until California. Absolutely amazing. If you were to lose just a fraction of a percent, that would be terrible because many bounces, many bounces, fraction of a percent, you lose everything after a certain distance. You, you should not lose anything in many, many, many miles of plastic material. And because it's totally, it's a total, it's a perfect reflection, you can actually do this. First application was in 1890 in the world exhibit which was organized in Paris. Here's a fountain and the person who first thought about guiding light didn't think about telephone conversations and so on. He thought about, you know, what, can, what neat tricks can we do with it? And one is to shine the light inside a water jet and illuminate it from the inside out. And you may have seen a, a, a lamp like this, which is based on the same principle. There's a light in the bottom and it illuminates these fibers and because the light can only escape at the tip at the end you see all the light all this beautiful and then there's a little things that change the color to make it more pretty this is the same thing and much bigger i can shine the light in here and you can see that it's forced to stay inside until it comes out here and if you actually were to look very closely you could see the laser beam bounce back and forth inside it so that's what happens whenever you place a telephone conversation. Now the fibers that we use in, uh, in telecommunications are much thinner than these ones. These are rather thick. The ones that are used in telecommunication are about the thickness of a hair or about 100 micron. And uh, 100 micron is very small, like a hair, but it's still too thick for things that you want to make very compact. For example, you can't take a fiber like this and bend it very tightly. If you were to bend this very tightly, then there where you bend it very tightly, the light would no longer be totally internally reflected and it would escape, right? Because now all of a sudden the light hits it at an angle that's, that's too steep and it goes out. So you cannot bend light very tightly and you can't make really micro scale devices with light. So we've been looking in the past uh, five years or so at ways to actually bend the light so tightly that you can start thinking about building optical chips, about using light instead of electronics to do computing, processing, and so on. Why would that be good? Well, light travels very fast, a lot faster than electrical signals, and light can be processed much faster than electrical signals. So if you could go from electronics to optics, you could increase the speed by about a factor of a million. So instead of a gigahertz uh, uh, chip, you could make a terahertz or even a faster chip than that. So you could increase the speed tremendously. Well, we developed a technique a few years ago, more or less by accident. And that's, that's one of the exciting things about science, that the really exciting science is often something you stumble, up, stumble on by, by accident. And this was sort of an accidental discovery. I didn't know in my lab much about the history of pulling fibers. Had I known about the history, I would have discovered that people in the 60s tried to pull very thin fibers and failed. But I didn't know that, it had not been written up. And as a result, I said one day to one of my coworkers, let's try to pull much thinner fibers than have been done before and see what happens on that scale. We found some of the same problems that other people had found, but we found a way around it too. And we managed to pull fibers as thin as 20 nanometers, which is about a factor thousand thinner than a hair. So these are really small. They're smaller than the wavelengths of the light. I want to give you a feel for how that compares to microelectronics. Our life now is controlled by microelectronics. You probably are wearing a watch or a digital camera or, or you might have a cellular phone on your belt or in your purse. All of these devices use electronic <clears throat> chips that you know, are little microscale devices that manipulate electric current rather than light. This is one such chip where we've removed the cover, and if you were to look inside, you'd see a little piece of silicon, which is a material that's derived from glass, on which metal leads have been evaporated 
that do all the magic of microelectronics that makes our lives so wonderful these days, or at least technology is so wonderful these days. We've actually sprinkled a few of the nanowires, of the glass nanowires that we're pulling in that flame above there on top of it. Can't see them yet. I have to zoom in on the microscope. So just to give you an idea, the, the width of that little chip is about a millimeter, which is, you know, one twentieth of an inch. It's, you know, pinhead, roughly. Now you can start to see some nanowires. There's one that goes there from the left to the right. We're going to zoom in, and in fact, I have to go to another type of microscope because optics is not good enough to resolve it. I have to go to an electron microscope in order to see that nanowire. And you can see something interesting right away, namely that the electronic lead, this is the wire, one of the wires on the chip that transports current or electric signal from one point to another. Notice it's bubbly and uneven on that scale. Electric current doesn't mind these bumps. Light is very fussy. Something has to be extremely smooth in order for light not to scatter uh, off. So let's zoom in to see actually how thick that nanowire is. Here it is. It's actually 300 nanometer, not 20 nanometer, but this was 300 nanometer thick. So it's a lot smaller than current uh, microelectronics. On the right, a picture of a nanowire, actually a nanowire tied in a knot, which would be a nano knot, I guess, on top of a human hair. That's what a, one of your hairs look like if you look at it really close up. But the really exciting thing is that we can take two of these nanowires close together. At the top, you see that they're, they're, they're touching each other. And when you send down light, the light hops over onto the other nanowire. That's pretty exciting, right? Because if you take two electrical wires and you touch them, you have an electrical contact and electricity goes from one wire to the other. Here we've done the same thing with light. It's like we have a wire for light where we can just touch them and have the light make optical contact between the two nanowires. So they guide light, but they guide light very differently. As I said before, the diameter of these nanowires is smaller than the wavelengths of the light, and light doesn't like to be confined that tightly. So instead of being like a hose for light, like an ordinary fiber is, they're more like a rail for light. The wire, the light hugs the wire and just, you know, follows it around to go from one point in space to uh, the other. And it turns out there are many new interesting phenomena about light that we can study that way. We can also bend the light very tightly. That bend there is about one twentieth the diameter of a hair. Here's a little device that we made, and it's less wide than the width of a hair that takes light in on the top left and then splits it into two. So it's like a little splitter for light, the smallest splitter ever made. That was the first device that we, uh, we built. I want to end by, by revisiting a question, why is smaller better? Well, one is it's faster because the signal has to travel less far. You know, each time the signal has to go from one switch or device or, or, or manipulation or process to the next, it has to travel, so it takes time. So the smaller you make it, the faster the device will be. The other advantage is less resources. You need far fewer materials. You can integrate it very densely, accomplish more with less space. And in addition, you can use a lot of new phenomena that occur at the nanoscale that do not occur at the macro scale and use those phenomena to actually make uh, devices. So I want to end again with that picture that I started in the beginning, which is just that flame. And just as you can take chewing gum and just, you know, pull it and it, it ends up being a, a, a thin wire, the same thing happens with glass. When you put it in a, in a flame, it gets soft much like chewing gum, and you pull it, and you can pull these extremely thin wires. It's extremely simple. I mean, the, the, the cost of building that is a few tens of dollars. It's not, not, much, uh, not much work. So what I want to leave you with is, even though the word nanotechnology may sound complex, it can be very simple. And with the simplicity, you, you end up being able to design devices that can do completely new things at a completely new scale. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those.